Friends, welcome back to the Ransomed Heart Podcast. John Eldridge this week with Alan, Arnold, and John Dale in the conversation. From time to time, we try and bring things from our own journals, from our own living experiences. I mean, in some ways, everything we do here is that. But, you know, once in a while, we, we try and bring something to you all that is uh, proving to be super important. In, at least in our life and in our experience in the world and our life with God. And this is one of those podcasts that fits that category, right? Yep. Scale of yes. one to 10. Yeah, this is a 10 last year. <laughs> 11. <laughs> yeah, this, this um, we, we do think the significance of this is, is great. And so it's in uh, love and some humility that we want to want to bring something we've been experiencing and and then how we've been responding to it. It requires going back and telling a story. So it was very interesting. This morning, I was actually doing another interview for somebody else's podcast, and they asked me the question, you know, you've been writing for a number of years now, a couple decades, number of books. Have you ever thought about quitting? Does that ever go through your mind? And I, I smiled and I said, funny you should ask that, because it was about a year ago that both Stacy and I found ourselves having conversations, you know, in the kitchen, sort of casual conversations that would go like this. I think we're done. I think we're done. I, I, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. And I had a, at the beginning of last year, I had a devotional coming out that was actually a very beautiful little book, and it's well-constructed. Stacy Burton on our team helped to design it and help bring it all together. It's beautiful. My attitude was, I don't care. I don't care how it goes. And I was aware enough to go, that doesn't sound like me. Right? right? Like, yeah. like that, that's, I don't know. There's something suspicious about that. So that was the first symptom. And then the second one was a little more startling. So a year ago, literally this month, Stacy, my Stacy, went in for hip surgery, hip replacement. Mm-hmm. She's inherited uh, terrible genes from her mother and among them arthritis and osteoarthritis and so she needed a second hip replacement and you know it's it's a significant deal it's actually kind of a gruesome surgery the way they do it you know they go in and lop off with a hacksaw the top of your femur and pound into your you know bone is you know fake one right a stainless steel ball but it's not like a big deal surgery. It's not brain surgery. It's not open heart surgery. It's not, you know, removing brain tumors or something that could be seriously touch and go. Most people survive hip replacements. Some people do have complications, though. And I remember going into the surgery feeling like, I didn't say this to anyone, but I feeling like Stacy's going to die. Wow. Isn't that weird? Yeah. Stacy's going to die. Now, here's what gets really weird. So, a uh, day of the surgery, I'm walking around outside the hospital praying. Blaine, my son, shows up to pray with me, and we're going along. And I share this concern with him so we could pray about it. And he said, that is so weird that you said that, because I felt the same thing. Mm. I'm like, whoa, that's... And then, to mm. top matters off, and I'm building a narrative here. You can feel the story yeah. arc on this. Stacy's fine. Surgery goes great. It's actually really great. Like, it's super healing and helpful. But she admits to me afterwards, she says, when I woke up in the recovery room, I was surprised because I kind of thought that I was going to pass on into heaven because of this surgery. Wow. And I'm like, whoa, time out, time out. Wait, what? You know, so we began to pray for some discernment on this. And, and we were also experiencing a good deal of what we would just call darkness or spiritual warfare. And asked you all to pray, and God revealed that what was at work was a spirit of death. And in Stacy's case, it was really obvious. It's like, you're going to die. And I shared this later with a friend of ours who, who's a very godly woman, walks very closely with Jesus, and she says, oh my goodness, all last year, I thought I was going to die. Okay, so spirit of death could be obvious in that regard, and she's healthy and we're fine and all is well. But this other thing about, ah, uh, just let it end. Ah, uh, who cares about our publishing? Ah, uh, who ca- I think I'm done. 
Then I began to realize, oh my gosh, this spirit of death is trying to bring about, quote, the end of things, Mm -hmm. right? And then as we began to share this as a team, so I brought this to you all, you remember in in a director's meeting about a year ago, a little more as we were discovering this, and going, I think this is bigger than we know. I think this has been operating for a long time here. And we were noticing it in relationships, mm-hmm. right? And it's like, well, just kind of let that one die. Like, it's okay. And in our personal lives, Stacy and I had a couple of friendships that were like, eh, you know, I don't know it's worth the effort anymore. We don't see them very often. They live in another state. Why make the effort? In other words, let it die. Let it end. That devotional that came out, I don't care, let it die. And so we, you know, uh, 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 we begin to see the flashing red lights, something very diabolical is at work here, and we named it as a spirit of death. Jesus named it as a spirit of death and said, hey, it's not just you guys. It's not just ransomed heart. This thing is rampant on the earth right now. And heads up to it. It is trying to get agreements with death, but it's also just trying to bring about, quote, the end of something, ends things, you know, a a mission, a vision, a friendship, a joy, right? Right. Yep. Yep. So brought that to the team. I'm bringing our listeners up to speed here in the story. So far, this is a monologue, not a podcast. And we began to ask Jesus how to pray. And he said, you know, because we have a life prayer. There's a life prayer on our app, if you have ever gone to the prayers section or on our website. And that prayer has been very helpful to us over the years. But Jesus very specifically this time said, bring the river of life against this. Pray the river of life. So you Bible readers will recall that in Revelation, when John sees the New Jerusalem, he sees the river of the life of God flowing from the throne of God. But it is flowing to his people, Mm -hmm. the life of God made available Mm -hmm. to his people. And then there's actually a a vision of it in the Old Testament. Ezekiel sees it in chapter 47. He reports the river of life flowing from the throne of God in the temple on earth. He saw it in, in the actual temple in Jerusalem. And he gives a long description of it. And I love the end of that narrative. He says, and wherever the river flows, everything will live. Mm. I love that. Mm. Okay, so this is the life of God being made available to his people, you know. And then Jesus in John 7, whoever believes in me, rivers of living water will actually flow from your inmost being. So there's a biblical context for Christ telling us to pray that. And so, and and the thing is, we had a sense that this spirit of death is very um, big, high-ranking, ancient, not the kind of thing you just run at and try and take down, but something rather more that you simply shield yourselves or your household or your kingdom or, you know, a friendship, a vacation, a project, a ministry, a church from. Mm. And the shield is the river of life. So we began to grow in this. We began to dialogue about this and, and invoking the river of life as a shield around us has proven to be so vital so helpful, so critical over the last year, I honestly can't remember if we've explained this to our constituents, but we wanted to today, (laughs) like, to go, this is super helpful, gang. Heads up, this thing is really rampaging, and the river of life made available to the people of God as our shield has proven helpful, I think, right? It has. So since I introduced that story what has been the fruit of that? Yeah, so that was back in April of last year is when I journaled for the first time about mm. it. And you talked about this alliance between hatred and death. Yes. And that the way we were supposed to respond was with the love of God yes. and the river of life. Yes. And if I'm completely honest, my internal reaction to that at first was like, really? <laughs> I, I mean, we were at the end of our event season, about to head into summer, and John Eldridge is throwing this, like, new category of super high-level spiritual warfare at us. And it was really interesting how the enemy tried to get me to just, like, blow it off as a, you know. Yes. 
But it, it was remarkable. Um, a little bit later in the year, I had been very specifically praying and asking God, Father, I need you to show me what is going on. This new level of warfare, because you stayed on it. Like you kept bringing this back up. Mm -hmm. Father, what's going on with this? And I journaled about that. And over the next two weeks, a couple of remarkable things happened. I went out for a mountain bike ride with my son, uh, which we do all the time, just down the street from our house. Your son is my, our 17. Son's about to turn 17. So in a kind of a world class. He, he's mountain a biker. phenomenal mountain biker. <laughs> when I say I go mountain biking with him, I, I try to keep up with him climbing, and then I just say goodbye to him on a downhill. <laughs> I mean, he's very, very good. He's very, very good. And on our way down, I just had this like feeling of dread. And I remember asking God, like, what is this about? And not really feeling like I got anything in response. And literally a minute or two after that, I went over to handlebars on my bike. I was kind of shaken up. I got back on my bike. My son came back up to find me. And he's like, oh, man, Dad, I'm glad you're okay. You know, I was kind of thinking through my head what would happen if my dad got hurt because I didn't have my phone on me and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. He's like, well, I'm going to go ahead again. And so he went ahead. And about three minutes later, I come around the corner to a section where my son probably goes 25, 30 miles an hour on this single track downhill. And I see my son's bike laying in the middle of the trail. And he is stumbling around in the middle of the trail, 15, 20 feet past the bike. Mm. To make a long story short, because the point of the story is not the, the details of his bike accident, search and rescue had to come in, like take him out on a stretcher, and we spent the evening at the emergency room. He was okay, but as I was journaling the next morning and asking God for interpretation of what had happened, God said, this spirit of death thing is real. And the spirit of death was going after mm. you and going after your son. And it's been really interesting because that, like, that was very a very sobering experience. And I'm very grateful for God's protection for myself and for Eli in that. But it's serious. This is a real thing. And we have found it is remarkably effective. And it's part of my daily prayer now is to pray the life of God against the spirit of death. The river of life coming from the throne of God has just become a part of my daily prayer over myself, over my family, over all of my domain. And gang, let me just jump in real quick and say, this is a very hopeful podcast. We really are not intending to alarm. It's taken a long time to even bring it up. But it's become so helpful to us to invoke the river of life as a shield in this hour that we just really kind of wanted to share it with you. So we, even now, I just want to pray, Jesus, as we discuss these things, as our listeners think about it, feel it, unpack it in their life, talk about it, only the presence of mm -hmm. Jesus, only the spirit of truth, Holy Spirit, you govern this, govern thoughts, govern feelings, govern emotions around this, only the life of God in the conversation and in its fruits. Only the life of God here. So, Alan, what about you? We've traveled on this literally about a year now. Right. For me, the categories are super helpful because I used to not have them. And a lot like John Dell was saying, when you first brought it up, John, I thought, well, that sounds huge. The spirit of death, the spirit of hatred, I, like I don't see them knocking at my door. So that's probably not happening in my world, but it happens in people like your world where you're leading a ministry and it's the few and the elect. And then God started opening my eyes to, no, actually it is. And it's, it's very hopeful when you start to realize how you don't have to allow it in. And so for me, the example at hand, right when you were introducing this to us, it was about the time my oldest son was graduating from high school and moving across the country. And so we celebrated that with him. We were for it. Uh, we have a close relationship. And then when he moved, 
He was so excited to be on his own, understandably, like any 18, 19-year-old. I didn't hear much from him for the first couple of weeks. And yeah. I would reach out and text or call and, hey, Dad, I got to run. And so I found, for me, it entered in through a death of hope, I guess, that, gosh, if this is the if this is where a relationship goes that's really close, once a child moves on, I think I'm going to pull back a little bit. Right. And I have two younger children, both in high school, and I found my heart just this death of hope in the sense of I invest so much, and if they just leave and they're gone, I think I'm going to pull back as a dad. I'm going to be present. I'm going to love them. But I'm going to dial it back. And as I process that with the lens of what you were saying, I realized it's not the physical death of somebody. It's the death, though, if I let this continue of a relationship at the very time in a lot of ways, he needs me more than ever, just in a different way. Mm. And the two at home, my two children at home need me big time. And if I start pulling back, boy, the enemy has gained huge traction and parts of my life that I care most about. Well, then it would play itself out, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Right. R- right? I mean, you, you pull away, so relationship does get strained. So then there is, quote, death in the relationship and yes. death in the hope of the future. And it seems more true. Yeah, and, yeah, you and then keep it confirms going. itself. And, right? right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And it goes on like but that. But he, because of what you said and because of praying the river of life into that— What's been astounding now, he's been gone about seven, eight months, and we just had a conversation yesterday, and he was, I mean, hungry, and he has been for the last month or so, asking me about life, about Mm. how to process things, Mm. uh, job opportunities. Mm. And so rivers of life have come into an area that the enemy was trying to cause me to believe were dead or dying. And it's it's easy to lose hope when those things happen. Mm-hmm. So for me, the big thing is just a sense of usually the spirit of death come in through an entry point of losing hope. Like that's my radar. Mm-hmm. That's a big one. That's good. Yeah. So death in a relationship, States and I had certainly seen that. Um, death in a project, death in a vision, death in a dream, just allowing the end of things. Right. How else— so John, another example for me, this is my journal back in September of last year, and I'll just read out of here. It says, I've been wrestling with thoughts like, and just talking about ransom heart, is this where I'm supposed to be? What else might I do? Mm. And there was this season that I went through where I just had all these questions coming up internally of, should I be at Ransom Heart? Is it time for me to move on? You know, it's been almost a decade. It's been a good season, but maybe I should go back to the business world. And as I prayed about it, and I actually came and and sort of talked to you a bit about it as well, God made it really clear that the enemy was just trying to get me to agree with the end of something. And this had to do with how the enemy feels about my calling and Mm. where I'm supposed to be right now. And he was just in there subtly trying to get me to agree with that. And you actually sent me, I don't know if if you sent me an email or called me or sent me a text, but... There, there's something that I now have printed out as part of my like front matter that I keep in my journal. And so this is my 2020 journal that I now have in my hands. And it says right here. I'm, what do you mean by front matter? Because okay. this is very helpful for people to practice. Sure. So every time I start a new journal, there are certain things that I keep in the front of my journal. There are some specific scriptures. There's a, sort of my theme passage for the year. I have some goals for the year my themes for the year, like the words God's given me. Um, And some of that stuff stays consistent from year to year. So I literally have like a Google Doc and I just reprint it out and just glue stick it in the the front of my journal so that I have it there. Got it. Um, And so one of the things that's now like a permanent fixture in the front of my journal is, is this little statement here. And I read it every morning before I journal. It says, I am called as an influencer. I am called to ransomed heart. I forbid doubt to get in. Mm. And that's just been really helpful because God gave me that as the antidote to these the lies of the enemy. Yes. And I now remind myself of that every single day. Yes. Yeah, that's so good. And to show the fruitfulness of this, for example, next month I'm releasing a new book. You know, so I didn't quit writing and I didn't 
quit Ransom Hard and I'm not done and I have joy in it and God's in it, but I almost, I was entertaining those things. Now, this gets hard. This has some really awful expressions of it. Stacey and I were mentoring a couple last year and doing some counseling with them. And these are beautiful people who have a very significant ministry, helping a lot of people. And their particular help is helping people to worship and helping people into intimacy with God. And he was describing he had lost his intimacy with God. They had taken some blow that they couldn't identify right at the heart of things particularly the husband, his own life with God, not his faith, he still believed, but in the intimacy with God, out of which everything else was flowing, you know, out of which their work was coming and they were helping other people into intimacy. And and we were able to shed light on that's death. Mm. Death was trying to strike at the core of end your intimacy with mm-hmm. God. And, and, you know, I had a beautiful time of prayer together and kind of explained that what's going on in, in the world today that this, this you know, high-ranking th- spirit has been rampaging you know, for a couple years now in particular on the earth, and there is a way out. There is mm-hmm. a protection. God doesn't leave his people unprovided for, and the protection has been something like this. I'm just going to model it right now. So, we invoke the river of life, the river of life, the very life of God itself, We invoke the river of life over us and around us, through us, because we want it flowing through us. That's John 7. Through our intimacy with God, we invoke the river of life beneath us and all around us, before and behind on every side. So we kind of surround ourselves with the river of life. And then I pray it for my household, and I literally pray it over my home. I, I invoke the river of life over my home and around it and through it and beneath it, on every side. Uh, when Ezekiel describes the river in, in chapter 47, he first he sees that it's ankle deep, and then the angel takes him farther, and it's knee deep, and then the angel farther, and it's waist deep. And then at the end, it is, quote, the river that cannot be crossed. It's so deep, it cannot be crossed. And that's what we sometimes add into the prayer. We invoke the river that cannot be crossed as our shield against death in this hour on the earth. Again, we're not taking this thing on. We're not trying to get into a cage fight with it, but we are invoking the river of life as a shield, a barrier against it. And the fruit of it has been really good. It's been really good. And what's beautiful about it is, John, you were, as you were saying, we invoke it. So there's a proactive nature. And a lot of times when we're feeling under the spirit of death, it's easy to want God to just do something and to go somewhat passive and to just think, I can't do anything. This is just overwhelming. And I think when we go to that place, we start looking for relief. Mm. But instead, to invoke the river of life, we have a role to play in this. It's Mm -hmm. there, Mm -hmm. and we need to invoke it. We Mm -hmm. just don't automatically find ourselves Mm knee-deep, ankle-deep in this in this river of life. No, mm. no. It's available to the people yes. of God, but needs to be seized. Right. It's such a rescue. I think, friends, one of the things that uh, you will find remarkable as you begin to practice this is the number of areas in your life that you begin to realize death has been trying to operate. Yeah. Uh, these things where you think it's you, you think you're the one that has the the, the issue, the problem, uh, the wrong way of thinking about it. And as you begin to invoke life um, and that spirit of death backs off, um, it's just, it's remarkable. Mm-hmm. It's refreshing. It's yes. like yeah. you've been carrying yeah. this heavy backpack around and all of a sudden you get to yes. toss it to the side of the road. That's good. Now, I, I want, I, I can feel, I can feel something trying to um, plague some of our listeners, we are not suggesting that the end of things is always the result of the spirit of death. Uh, sometimes things do have a season to them, and you know, church plants come to a, a splitting and they need to grow, or you know, uh, kids move off to college and it's just a phase of life thing, and and you are empty nesters, or you know, there's just a whole variety of expressions yep. that 
even physical death. I want to be very careful that we're not saying that now every physical death that's going on around us is a result of the spirit of death. Um, But it would be a good idea to invoke the river of life on a regular basis as your shield in this hour, knowing that this is operating. Now, what we were also noticing at the same time was a different experience um, but one that that certainly works in partnership with death, and that is hatred. And obviously, hatred is rampaging on the earth. It, you know, the the Time magazine cover story a couple years ago is how do we lose the internet to the culture of hate? You know, trolling and and all that kind of thing that um, you know people say and do awful things you now with a kind of anonymity that's allowed this culture of hate to kind of seize social media and that sort of thing. But my goodness, I mean, you take terrorism, you take, you know, the refugee crises, you, you know, there, um, racial tension still uh, in all parts of the world. You know, there's a lot of hatred out there. Um, and, and yes, human sin can sure explain for a lot of it, but it isn't sufficient to explain all of it. It's it is the fire on which a gasoline gets thrown. And the gasoline is the warfare, and the gasoline is a spirit of hatred. And the spirit of hatred um, will come in 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 lots of different ways. Um, Sometimes you will feel hated, um, but like with death, sometimes it's not that obvious. Um, Sometimes it will try and get me to hate, um, you know, somebody, you know, writes in something terrible to me or somebody cuts me off on the freeway in, a, in, in not just an offensive but a like dangerous way, you know, threatening lives and stuff. And, you know, that I can feel the enemy enticing me to hate. So sometimes it's that. Sometimes it's obvious. It's, oh, this is hate. But I think we've all been experiencing it a little bit more subtly. Um, for me it actually was expressing itself as a lot of condemnation, a lot of accusation. That was a stupid thing to say. That was a stupid thing to write. You shouldn't have sent that email. Just just under lots of accusation. But when I asked Jesus about it, I'm like, wow, this really feels like accusation. He says, no, actually, it's hatred right now. This is is what's behind that experience. And, And Alan, you were describing uh, hatred in the loss of joy, or how is that? Yeah, hatred in the loss of, of joy that started for me in a subtle way, which was a different form of self-hatred, I think, which was you don't really, your presence doesn't matter, you're not really needed. And so it would play out in family settings where I would go upstairs and go to bed early because I didn't really feel like anybody cared and and that couldn't be further from the truth, but I felt that way, or I'd be at a gathering and want to kind of slip out early yes. because nobody cares if you're here or not. You don't you don't really have anything to add and won't be missed. And so for me, that self hatred came in through the enemy, through the spirit of hatred, and the result was a loss of joy, a loss of presence, a loss of strength um, in in who I was. Because, I, I mean, if the enemy can take you out in that way, you're not even present mm-hmm. to do all that God has for you to do. Mm-hmm. And that was playing out in work relationships and family, all kind of ways. Mm. What about you, John? How has hatred come against you guys? Yeah, so I, I think that the way that we've experienced or that has been exposed is how the enemy's hatred of who we are and of our calling— um, he will, he'll latch on to other things. So there, there might be people who say accusatory things and it's real easy to get really upset with that person. And as we've, there've been a couple of cases in the last year where as we've prayed into it, it's been really clear. Oh, actually there's a spirit of hatred that is motivating that person. Yes. And what what we need to do is pray the love of God against the hatred yes. rather than trying to fix a relationship that actually isn't the issue. Yes. Um, it's yeah. that, it's that the thing, the, the thing behind the thing yep. is, is the issue. It's it so is often the issue. hatred. Yeah. That's what we're trying to expose. The thing behind the thing. 
and and sometimes the experience is you just feel like crap, mm. and you can't name why, but you just feel awful. Right. And and then to ask Christ to shed light on it, and you know, about eight times out of ten, what we're hearing is hatred, and so that's why we're profiling these two things right now. And then, as you both have mentioned, they seem to be working in tandem. Right. You know, hatred in a relationship, trying to bring about the end of it, and therefore in cahoots with death, or you know, death coming against us um, using hatred against projects or dreams, or callings, that kind of thing. And again, the antidote is what we want to talk about. The the thing we want to give you today, river of life and the love of God, Mm -hmm. actually praying and enforcing the love of God. Now, I know that I did write about this in the newsletter, maybe even more than once in the last couple years. So, um, and and we, we, we've got actually some questions about, really, you actually kind of enforce the love of God? I thought, that seems weird. I thought the love of God was just the love of God. It just comes to us, you know. But we are active partners with God in this world. And as with so many other things, like the gospel, you know, the gospel is a dramatic example. God could simply seize all communication channels in the world. He could do that. He could seize all radio stations television stations, the internet, right? Uh, you know, and simply broadcast the gospel uh, so that the whole world hears. But he chose not to do that. For 2,000 years, he's chosen not to do that. And instead, he entrusts the proclamation of something as absolutely critical as the gospel. He entrusts it to us. We are, we are his partners. Paul says, how will they hear unless we speak? How will and unless we're sent in Romans. And so you can see there the partnership in something very sober and very important. Well, it's like that here too. The love of God is available to us all the time. Most people don't experience it for a variety of reasons. But in this case, what we are talking about is commanding it, praying it, invoking it. I bring the love of God as a shield against hatred in this hour. On the earth, I invoke mm-hmm. the love of God over my life. I invoke the love of God over my family. I invoke the love of God in my kingdom. And f- I find myself needing to really enforce that because this this isn't a quick you know, little three-second thing. It's like, no, I really do command that only love gets to reign in my household. I really do command this. Only mm-hmm. love in this relationship. Or only love in this project, or you know, I'm I am I am insisting on it. There's a right, There's yeah, a, yeah. I mean, John, in one of your emails last year to us as a team, uh, you quoted Chesterton talking about furious opposites, mm-hmm. and that that's what we're talking about here. It's the the hatred of the enemy. The furious opposite is the love of God. Yeah, and so that daily invocation yes. of the love of God and the river of life is the antidote. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And and what's wonderful about these two things, gang, it, it is going to take a little resilience. It is going to take some some resolve, but that's good for you. <laughs> like exercise is good for you, okay? Like um like being forgiving is good for you. You know, turning the other cheek is good for you, right? This will this will be good for you. Um it takes a little resolve, but we're talking about invoking and commanding two things that are absolutely wonderful. Mm-hmm. You're invoking life and you're invoking love mm-hmm. into your household and your kingdom and the, you know, the realm in which you have domain. And again, um, if you've heard any of our other teaching on spiritual warfare, you know, you know the power of breaking agreements with it. So if you've been making agreements with hatred, you want to break those agreements. If you've been making agreements with death and letting something end, or even, the, you know, the dear friend of ours who confessed that all last year she thought she was going to die. Well, you right. want to break agreements with that. I'm not about to die. Right. But there is, an, there is an enforcing here. I love this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Um, it says, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. And the love of God is the fire of God. And there's lots of visions of this, that fire will go before you and consume your enemies. And there's a vision of in Daniel of fire flowing mm-hmm. out from the throne of God. So not just only the river, but fire. 
But it is his love. It is his love. And the only thing that it consumes is what's bad. It doesn't harm what's good. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't harm human beings. But it is a wonderful shield. So we actually invoke the fire love of God. I, yes. I invoke the fire love of God as a shield for me mm -hmm. and for my household right now. And then if something particular is going on in this relationship, in this project, and you know, I invoke the fire love of God against hatred as our shield right mm -hmm. now, against hatred in this hour on the earth. And then that's it. I don't get into a dogfight with this thing. I, I don't get baited by it. And if I need to enforce that again in 30 minutes, I do. You know, um, the enemy will often test your resolve to see, really? You're really going to create a shield here or I still get to yeah. beat you up? No, I mean this, you know, and so kind of an insistence on it. And nowadays, how often are you practicing this? I, I practice it daily. And in the evening— I'll pray the love of God, the river of life within our home and before I go to bed and the fiery love of God around our home yes. for protection as a barrier, as a shield. And, and it's been so helpful. And the fruit of, of it for me has been what we see is less fear, less rage, mm. less offense, mm. less mm. anger the uh, a lessening of hopelessness, like all of those things mm. lessen and the fruit of it is life and love, as you said. Like yeah. it's, it, test it and see what happens. But for us and my family, it's been huge. Yeah, John, it's, it's provided relief. Uh, there have been things, issues that have plagued us over an extended period of time. Mm that we would find momentary relief from with certain approaches and strategies. And then when you shared this with us and we started, you know, bringing love and life, um, we actually, the issues aren't gone, but there's a shield between us and them. Right. Um, that's, it's just remarkable. Yeah. It's so good. It's so helpful. And it's the, in, it's in the spirit of helpfulness that we wanted to bring this to you all. Um, we live in one of the last moments on the earth, um, and to show you how real that is, um, Paul thought he did. Hmm. So if, if and Peter writes about it as well, these you know, dear children, these are the last hours. Well, if they were in the last hours, then we are in the last seconds. <laughs> yeah, because we believe Scripture and we believe the Holy Spirit was not deceiving His people. So. You know, if they thought it was near the end, can you imagine how much, you know, those were hours, these are seconds, mm -hmm. minutes and seconds. Um, so that's a gnarly time. The scripture has all kinds of uh, things to say about that, that it's a, it's a hard time to be a human being. It's a gnarly time. It's a, it's a difficult time to thrive in love. It's a difficult time to thrive in hope and in life. And, um, and therefore, these two tools, fire love of God against hatred in this hour on the earth, and I'll often add, and all of its servants and all their devices, and the river of life as our shield right now against death on the earth and all of its servants and their devices in the name of Jesus, simply invoking it as a shield, not getting into uh, uh, a knockdown drag out with these guys, just nope, not here, not in my realm, not in my kingdom, will prove extraordinarily helpful to you all. And so we do it even now as we close. We, we invoke the fire love of God. God is love, John says, and he who lives in love lives in God and God in him or her. We live in God, and so we invoke the fire love of God over us, around us, beneath us, as our shield. The fire love of God for our households. The fire love of God is our shield against hatred in this hour on the earth and all its servants and all their devices. And we invoke the river of life now that flows from the throne of God, the river that cannot be crossed. 
And we want this one flowing through us, the river over us and around us and through us and beneath us, before, behind, on every side, the river that can't be crossed, the river of life as our shield now against death in this hour on the earth and all of its servants and all of their devices. In the name of our Lord Jesus. And we thank you, God. Thank you for these resources. Thank you that you make provision for your people, even in an hour like ours. Sure hope this was helpful, friends. Love you all and uh, bless you here in late January.